what is Darwinian evolution or what is the common current orthodox thought of your typical evolutionary biologist? Well, when Darwin proposed the theory of evolution in 1859, he had a hypothesis which supposed that all species were related by common descent through a process known as descent with modification. And he looked at things like selective breeding of plants and animals and extrapolated those to the common descent of all species. And so now, uh, since we understand DNA, we understand a lot more about evolution. And so there's what's called the modern synthesis today, which was formulated in the early to mid 19th or 20th century. And so that synthesis is somewhat different than what Darwin proposed. And typically, if you look up evolution on the web, like on Wikipedia or something, it'll say evolution is defined as genetic change over time or change in allele frequencies over time, change in genetic variance over time. Okay, now, this is an all-inclusive all -inclusive idea which really muddies the water because that isn't really what Darwin was proposing because he understood selective breeding. That was understood centuries before Darwin was born. And so what happens is evolutionary biologists take a very, very loose definition, genetic change over time, which no one disputes, and say, okay, we have that, so we observe evolution today. And so therefore, there's really no question, evolution is a process. When in fact, what Darwin meant was gradual progressive change involving fundamentally changed information. Even though he didn't understand DNA, that's the way it should be designed. So what I'm saying is I don't really agree with the modern definitions that are commonly advanced in biology textbooks, on the internet, in speeches. They'll say it's just genetic change over time, but that's not what it is. It's if you take, for example, a uh, a dinosaur with scales and propose that he changed into a bird with feathers that could fly over millions of years, that would require the addition of millions of units of increased genetic information. Now that sort of phenomenon is not observed, never been observed. So can I can I revisit some of what you've said already up to this point? I want to make sure that I understand what it is that you've laid out. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the theory of evolution that Darwin has in his mind uh, at the time he writes on the origin of species and later the descent of man is different than what current uh, evolutionary biologists are saying. Is that true? Exactly. Because they commonly define it, the mechanism, as random variation plus natural selection plus a great deal of time. Darwin noticed that the offspring of all species has variations. If you take pigeons or you take dogs, the offspring are slightly different. There's little, there's a, a spectrum of genetic diversity in all species. And so you can take those variations and breed different strains different breeds. And so those already exist in the population. If you take dogs, for example, which has been, they have been selectively bred for thousands of years. Virtually every trait that you see in a dog breed, such as a poodle, a chihuahua, a St. Bernard, those traits have already have always existed in the genome of the dog species. And so Darwin took that to extrapolate to the origin of all species, that these variations exist. When, when you think about fixed traits like the origin of feathers from reptilian skin, there are no variations in reptiles that could lead to the origin of a feather. It would require fundamental change. It would require mutation. And so what I'm saying is this whole idea of random variations, to extend that to all the grand claims of evolution is a false extrapolation. The Changes required to create a feather from reptilian skin don't exist in the offspring of any reptile. And you can take that to any proposed macroevolutionary change. Now, what I mean by natural selection, I think most people understand that to mean the uh, survival of the fittest, the most uh, adapted to the environment will, on average, survive over those who are less adapted. And so that's the proposed mechanism. Okay. With plus time. Plus millions of years. That's right. 
So will anything that you've set up until now trigger a uh, a um, criticism from an evolutionary biologist uh, in your description of their worldview? Or would you think that they would consider that a fair a fair articulation of their paradigm? I think I've fairly described it, but I'm sure that they will adamantly disagree because they have no examples of true evolution that they can cite as evidence. And so what they cite is things like antibiotic resistance in bacteria, which is not evolution because it doesn't involve fundamentally changed or added genetic information. And so they'll take these minor changes, mutations, which we know are within the reach of probability. And by the way, which occur in an asexually reproducing species. And that in and of itself can't be applied to higher organisms. Okay, but they'll take observations and selective breeding and they'll apply that to things which have never been observed, like the proposed evolution of an ape to a man or of a reptile to a flying bird, things like that. And so they will disagree because that's the only evidence or that's the only observable, quote, evolution that they can point to is things like antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. So did Darwin recognize in his own day the weakness, any of the weaknesses in his proposed theory? One of the weaknesses that he recognized was the fossil record. He recognized that it did not support the predictions of gradualism that you would logically come up with. Uh, and and then assuming that evolutionary theory was true, because there would be millions and millions of intermediate forms. And he acknowledged this plainly in his book. And he stated that he thought future uh, research into paleontology would uh, show these transitional species. Has the fossil record improved to the point where now Darwin's fears have been uh, laid to rest, or do we still have the problem that Darwin identified? We have the exact same problem, although evolutionary biologists will sharply disagree. They will say that there are thousands of transitional species. And the problem is the fossil record is extremely subjective. It's interpreted by a few people who have expertise in comparative anatomy and it's accepted globally by the entire evolutionary community which don't have expertise in paleontology they just accept it the other another uh, obstacle that darwin saw is the continuity of life basically all of life today is what we call typological meaning that uh, species are organized into different groups birds mammals, fish, reptiles, plants, and so forth. And he, he thought that with, logically you would think that evolution would be, uh, or that life today, if evolution was a true process, would be confu a confusion, that there would be gradations between birds and mammals, for example, which they don't exist. And so he acknowledged that as a problem. So I think those... And, and another thing he acknowledged was things like beauty and how uh, aesthetic design in nature is not really explicable by Darwinian mechanisms, or at least it's very difficult to explain the extreme ornamentation of some animals, such as the peacock. 